Why does this matter? It makes a crash vicious. Uh, when a crash starts to happen, these people that are out on leverage, unless they're betting on the downside, but right now we've got a lot more bulls than bears out there. So anybody betting on the upside, once it starts going against them, this leverage is a killer. Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and this video is going to be a little bit different today. I collect charts and images and snapshots of things all the time, and I mean to use them in a video, but sometimes they just do not fit into the conversation. So this one's going to be a little bit random. I'm just going to talk about a bunch of this stuff that I, I keep on wanting to present, but I'm never able to fit it into the storyline. So this first one's a snapshot of an email that I receive. As a business owner, uh, I get all of these emails from companies that are trying to provide services to the business. So this one says that the I, there's a new IRS COVID program that pays you up to $5,000 per employee in 2020 and up to $28,000 per employee in 2021. The great news is that there is no underwriting process and you don't pay it back. <laughs> <laughs> Think of this program as Personal Paycheck Protection 3.0. They are literally giving away currency. They, he, this guy calls it money. Uh, they'll send you a check or you can apply it to what you owe. So you can just deduct it from your taxes. Now, everybody needs to remember that it isn't the government paying for this. You pay for it. I pay for it. This comes out of taxes, and there were, are two basic forms of taxes. There's income tax, and then there's the inflation tax. If they're paying for this by printing currency, that just means that you know they're diluting the currency supply. If this goes to businesses and into the retail sector, it, it dilutes the currency supply in that sector and causes prices to rise. The cost of gasoline, the cost of groceries, the general cost of living goes up. So that's how you pay for it if they're printing the currency. If not, it's coming out of your income tax. So is this the way that you want your taxes to be spent? Now, speaking of taxes, let's take a look at all government spending as a percentage of GDP. And this chart goes all the way back to 1900. I love historic data like this, where you get the big context of things. Notice that the federal government spending is a very small percentage. This is like 3% of GDP. Uh, most of it was local. The, the yellow line in the middle is state. This orange line is local spending. So you're talking about back when they would have a town hall meeting and everybody would get together and say, we need a fire department. So what did they do? Uh, they would order a fire truck and some equipment and then it was a volunteer fire department because the, the, the town just really couldn't afford to do so back then it was uh, people that were very civic minded and uh, they would get together and they would be the volunteers for the fire department do some practice and then if the bell rang uh, the firemen came running out of their houses in the middle of the night you know uh, sound asleep and then they uh, put out the fire uh, and so here's the the World War one and the federal government really gets involved it came back down during the 20s but then we've got the crash of 29 and uh, the uh, you know all the government spending and the government ends up here at about 12 percent of GDP the federal government still local spending and state spending uh, are as big uh, as you know or even outweigh federal government spending uh, at certain points but then you see World War II and then this constant growth and it just never ever stops now uh, they've got intergovernmental transfers state transfer payments so this is uh, federal government funding uh, state programs and stuff they transfer to the states so really it's all coming out of federal so it boosts this up to 25 percent roughly uh, but it's just interesting, you know, that it's approaching 50% of the economy is the government doing all this spending. Now, uh, this is income and payroll uh, taxes as a growing share of federal revenue. Uh, and what you see here, this, this is a historic chart. This is old. Uh, it goes to 2014, and then the, all of this is projected. Uh, we'll see how those projections worked out in a moment. 
But the reason I like this one is this is the one that I could find that went back to 1935. And back then, payroll taxes didn't exist. So when we came up with Social Security, Social Security and then later we came up with Medicare and so on, um, uh, that is what the payroll taxes are coming out of. This is individual income tax. If you could take this back to 1913, it's at zero. <laughs> there wasn't any before World War I. And then it increased and increased and increased. And, you know, now it's at, uh, you know, you know what the different tax rates are. Uh, and the, in the 50s, the highest tax rates were up at, uh, over 90 percent, 92 percent income tax in certain brackets. Um, but uh, what you see here is this growth of payroll taxes. Now, what is a payroll tax? A payroll tax is income tax because <laughs> if the company doesn't hire you, it doesn't pay this tax. It's paying this tax on your behalf. You have to uh, pay Medicare, Social Security. These are matching taxes, but they top out at a certain amount of pay. And so uh, this is mostly paid by lower income people and they don't even realize it. We think we have this graduated uh, tax structure where people that don't make much don't pay any taxes and people that make a lot pay most of the taxes, except with payroll taxes being capped, this becomes a smaller and smaller and smaller percentage of the income tax that you're paying as you make more and more and more. Uh, the less you make, the larger this is as a percentage. But the person that's actually, uh, you know, it, it's the company paying this, but they're paying it on your behalf because if they don't hire you, they don't pay it. So it's really, it should be lumped on with, in with income tax. So here is an, a more updated chart. And you can see that corporate tax is shrinking. So this goes out to 2019. The other one stopped in 2014. They had corporate tax uh, expanding. They were correct as far as income tax continuing to rise, and now it's rising even further with the, the new tax laws. Uh, so it's just interesting. Just realize that your taxes are not, if you think that you're paying 25 or 30 or 35 or 40, whatever that figure is, you've got to add a whole lot more to that because of the payroll taxes. So uh, of the total tax, federal tax revenues, this is for fisc estimated for fiscal year 2021, about half of what the government gets is income tax. It's coming out of our pockets as income tax. And then another 35% or so is payroll taxes. So really, the income tax, the, the tax that is coming because individuals work is somewhere on the order of like 85 percent and then you've got all the rest of the taxes uh, so you know people just need to realize what's coming out of their pocket this is something i'm jumping now to something i see some cycles in the economy and when i look at a long-term chart of the stock market this goes back to 1789 so this is a composite of different indexes because the dow jones industrial average uh, didn't come around until uh, the 19... It came around in the late 1800s, but it was only like 13 companies and then 16. And so it was in the 20s that I believe that it became what it is uh, today, basically. Um, and so they've, they've, they've pasted a couple of different composites together here. But I do see sort of a cycle happening here. And what's interesting, it, it looks like it's a, maybe like the, a 90 year cycle to these big crashes that happen. Here's a big crash and here's the 1929 crash. And um, if you add 19, <laughs> 90 years to uh, uh, 1932, 1933, you get 2022, uh, 2023 is when this would be, if this holds up, when you'd be seeing this event. Now within that, there's smaller cycles. Uh, this is an average of a, so you've got two eight-year cycles and a five-year cycle here, so it averages seven years. And the last time that we had uh, any major pullback here, uh, this is uh, right at the beginning of 2016. So you, you, you add another 
seven years to that. And we're talking 2023 is what this would be suggesting. Now, we've had a couple of major things there, but the stock market just keeps on plowing ahead. It bounces right out of them. So uh, we might see some. And then we've got speculators maxed out on leverage. So here we have just these record levels of margin debt. Why does this matter? It makes a crash vicious. Uh, when a crash starts to happen, these people that are out on leverage, unless they're betting on the downside, but right now we've got a lot more bulls than bears out there. So anybody betting on the upside, once it starts going against them, this leverage is a killer and it causes them to have to liquidate everything to cover margin. Uh, now, when there's events in the economy, we see this consolidation happening. So here's 1990 to 1995, and then so on. And this, this stops in 2009. But these are the big four banks gobbling up all of these other banks that used to exist back in 1990. This is just a 19-year period. From uh, 1990 to 2009, all of these different banks being gobbled up by the big four banks. And that type of thing will continue, uh, especially when there is economic stress. You can see uh, that during that long-term capital management crisis, there were a whole bunch of banks that got gobbled up at about the same time. And then uh, the final stuff happened in the 2006 to 2009 time period when a whole bunch of banks got into trouble because of the mortgage-backed securities. Now we're going to switch gears again. Uh, you know, during periods of stress and crashes, the government does tend to become overreaching and things do tend to be... And, and if you go to episode five of Hidden Secrets of Money, you'll see where I talk about this uh, swing of uh, individualism to collectivism to individualism to collectivism, again, going throughout time. And we are on this swing toward collectivism. Uh, you know, you, you hear a lot of people talking about socialism and such. So the Bank of England tells ministers to intervene on digital currency programming. Digital cash could be pro programmed to ensure it is only spent on essentials or goods which an employer or government deems to be sensible. So <laughs> you'll only be able to spend your currency on what they decide. The Bank of England has called on ministers to decide whether a central bank digital currency should be programmable, ultimately giving the issuer control over how it is spent by the recipient. Programming could become a key feature of any future central bank digital currency. Now, uh, quite a while back, uh, it was George Gammon, actually, that, you know, I had been talking about uh, digital currency, central bank digital currency for years, but George Gammon was the one that uh, sort of alerted me to the fact that <laughs> because uh, digital currency is programmable, that the government can control everything that you do. So as we go to this swing to collectivism, I just want to show you some uh, tweets and memes and things like that have been going back and forth. Can someone send me all the research uh, done by socialist economists about how the planned economy is superior to the free market? I'm trying to find articles about why the planned economy is superior to the free market, but I can't seem to find any. <laughs> Last year marked 200 years since Karl Marx was born. Here is a list of the top five nations where his ideas brought prosperity. <laughs> it's five blanks. And then, every socialist is a disguised dictator. Now you have to realize that socialism is basically the idea that if we all just, we're, we're all gonna be all right if we just steal a little bit more from each other. We just all have to, we, you know, it's, it's basically this idea that we should share everything, except uh, you can't opt out. You have to force everybody into this program or the program won't work. And so they have to do this at a point of the gun. So every socialist is a dictator. 
Why can't they allow opting out? Because at first you want to steal from just the richest people, right? So you, you steal from the rich and you share it between everybody else and the rich will all opt out. So you can't steal from them any, anymore because they opt out. So now you've got to steal from the upper middle class. And as soon as you do that, they will opt out. Now you got to steal from the middle class. And as soon as you do that, they will opt out. Now you've just got a whole bunch of poor people trying to steal from each other and there's nothing to steal. So it won't work. The only way to get uh, socialism to work, and it doesn't work over the long run, <laughs> it always falls apart. Over the short run, though, it will work, but it goes through these decaying steps. Uh, and so I want to thank the great Thomas Sowell. What is history? but the story of how politicians have squandered the blood and the treasures of the human race. Thank you, Thomas Sowell, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.